Okay, so we're going to begin um, as people are still clicking in. But I'll start just by a few brief announcements before we start the seminar with uh, Dr. Jacques Gauthier. I just wanted to say that next week we'll have two lectures. It's not on our website. I'm going to be speaking next week about anti-Semitism in the United States. That'll be Monday. And on Wednesday, our colleague Harris Rafiq will also be giving a lecture. He's an expert on political Islams and anti-Semitism. And then the following week, we have Professor Yossi Shane from Tel Aviv. So um, today, it's, uh, we're honored to have Jacques Gauthier with us. And the title of his uh, seminar, of his lecture, is entitled the, Source, the Sources of Israeli Territorial Sovereignty Over Jerusalem and Its Historic Homeland Under International Law. And of course, this is a very a uh, pertinent issue. It's an issue that's in the news again, and I suspect it will be for the next few months, at least. Um, we're honored that Jacques Gauthier is with us. Jo Dr. Jacques Gauthier is a Canadian lawyer and scholar and public intellectual. He received his PhD from the University of Geneva, and his dissertation was entitled Sovereignty Over the Old City of Jerusalem. Dr. Jacques Gauthier's international practice has focused on many issues of human rights. He's the founder of a Toronto law firm, uh, Gauthier and Associates, Associates, which was established in Toronto in 1984. He served as a legal counsel to different governments around the world, including the governments of France, Spain, Mexico, and Canada. In 2000, he was knighted by the president of France as the Chevalier de l'Ordre National de Merit. Uh, and it's a very prestigious honor. In 2015, he was assigned and knighted as the President of the Republic of France, and he was appointed as the Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur. Dr. Gauthier has presented his findings on the sovereignty of, of the city of Jerusalem and the disputed territories to many international centers, including and institutions, including in the House of Commons in London, the US Congress in Washington, DC, the Italian Senate in Rome, the United Nations in New York, and the European Union in Brussels. He also presented his findings in the Japanese Parliament and in the Canadian Parliament, as well as the Hague and the Dutch uh, Parliament. His work has also been presented in conferences in Jerusalem, in Geneva, Basel, San Remo, an important place vis-a-vis -vis this issue, and Toronto. So it's really an honor to have Dr. Gauthier with us. And uh, Jacques, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for being here with us today. And also, thank you for your exhaustive contribution to knowledge. I urge people to read your work, and it's really seminal. And I, I, I don't say that about, I've never said that before. But your work on this issue is uh, incredible, incredible and in-depth. And really, we're, we're honored that you're here. You're being very kind, uh, Charles. Thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. I, I do believe it's timely. Uh, the issue has been relevant for decades. In fact, throughout the 20th century, it's been uh, a matter of debate and discussion in international uh, settings, but uh, very much so again over the next weeks, over the next months. So the, the question is, uh, there are Jews, there are Israelis who inhabit, who have um, established communities in places uh, in the disputed territories, in parts of Jerusalem, and the nations have a course. They are violating international law. They're thieves. They have taken land that belongs to the Palestinians. They are usurpers. They are outlaws. And of course, all of those allegations depend on the answer to a particular question. Have the Jews been given the right in international law to be in every part of Jerusalem, to be in every part of the disputed territories? That's the question. It took over 20 years for me to get to the answer. Because the, one of the challenges, one of the reasons 
reasons for the, the false narratives is that in order to get to the right answer, you have to look at a lot of facts. And if you're a lawyer, if you're a judge, you can't make a decision unless you look at the facts. Well, it took me about 20 years to reach my conclusions. And here's the document. It's, it's a thesis that weighs 10 pounds, which came out of my research. And I was exasperated because every time I thought I'd looked at uh, every aspect, at every argument, something else would come up. My conclusion, the Jewish people, and I stress the Jewish people and the state of Israel, have been given the right to possess, to inhabit every component of the city of Jerusalem as it is configured today, every part of the disputed territories. I'll go further. The positions taken by the nations, by Europe, the European Union, the Russians, many others, is fraudulent. It is fraud because it's an attempt to pervert the truth, to deny the rights that have been given. The question is now being asked, is there such a thing as a right based on historical connection to the, the Holy Land, between the Jews and the Holy Land? Is there such a thing as a right to reconstitute what these people used to have, these ancient people used to have for thousands of years? And what is so troubling for jurists? is to realize how the very question I've referred to has been dealt with. Decisions have been made. There's a principle called chose jugé, res judicata. It's been dealt with and the decisions have been made by those who had the power of disposition. The challenge is that there is a blurring between political arguments and legal arguments. And the hostile international uh, setting fueled by anti-Semitism, disguised of course as anti-Israel and anti-Zionist arguments, this has resulted in the denial of the rights. So what I want to do, and uh, you can imagine the challenge for me, because I want to take you, it's not enough to, to present my conclusions. What is the foundation? I'm saying to you the decisions have been made by those who had the right to make the decisions. Title has been given in respect to a territory, a defined territory. When did that happen? Let's look at the, the facts, the historical facts. All right, what we need to do when I talk about the sources is that we need to concentrate and focus on the events which resulted in the granting of sovereignty, the granting of territorial sovereignty to the Jewish people in Israel. Also, I want to look at the nexus between these events. On the slide in front of you right now, you've got a summary, an outline of the key events. So let's deal with each one of them. The Balfour Declaration. If there is one historical fact or event that is well known, it's the Balfour Declaration. Where does it fit in? The Balfour Declaration of 1917 was not the act of one man. If you look at the, the heading of the declaration, it was in fact the war cabinet that made a decision and it's conveyed through Lord Balfour, but it's a decision of the War Cabinet. And you will note that it's a declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations. What were the Jewish Zionist aspirations? Important question, because if, if support has been given to these aspirations, we need to understand what they were. 
But I want to stress that in 1917, uh, Great Britain did not have possession of all the territory in question that they referred to as Palestine. In fact, they didn't have title. So if you ask me, was that by itself a, a sufficient source of rights and title? The answer is no. However, you have to look at it as an egg that had to be fertilized. And I'm gonna tell you, and I'm gonna explain exactly what happened when this egg was fertilized, re re resulting in the creation of the rights that I've been referring to. This particular declaration was politically extremely significant. It came about because of the hard work of Jewish leaders like Wiseman and others, but it was a recognition that it was time for the nations to deal with the Jewish question. That the mistreatment of the Jews, the murdering of Jews, sometimes by the hundreds, sometimes by the millions, the shameful conduct of the nations who expelled the Jews over the centuries had to be recognized and it had to be redressed. And that was the motivation behind this declaration. The aspirations. Of course, we know about Theodore Herzl. Note the title of his pamphlet, The Jewish State. So today, when there's a debate about what is this state supposed to be about, it's about to be a home and a nation for the Jewish people. What are the aspirations that were recognized and supported by the British in 1917? Those aspirations, the establishment of a Jewish state. In 1897, during the Basel Conference, his opening words, Herzl's opening words were, we are here to lay the foundation stone of a house which will shelter the Jewish nation. The first component of the Basel program the aim is to create for the Jewish people a legally assured home in Palestine. All right, the aspirations. So at the time of the declaration, 1917, the area wasn't called Palestine. You see here the, the subdivisions of the Ottoman territories and it, it, it was uh, not known as, as, as Palestine. So when the, the British referred to Palestine, what did they mean? Well, in, in, in British history, in British, the key circles, Palestine always meant the biblical lands. Paris Peace Conference, second key component of any analysis. Why is it so important? It was at the Quai d'Orsay that for six months, the allies gathered in order to address, in order to deal with many questions uh, that were facing those who had been defeated, the victorious nations had to enter into peace treaties with the defeated nations and, and, and impose some conditions and terms upon them. You have to understand, if, you, if, if we fail to understand the importance of the Supreme Council, the principal allied powers, then you won't understand the analysis that will follow. There were five nations. You see four leaders here, the key leaders in Paris, but the five nations, the US, the French, the Italians, the British, and the Japanese. That's why I went to speak uh, to uh, the members of parliament in Tokyo. During the Paris Peace Conference, if you're a lawyer, you understand that nothing happens in the legal proceeding until you've presented your case. There's a hearing. Do you know that on February the 6th, the Arabs, one of the parties, there were two parties, the Arabs and the Jews, as far as the, the Middle East was concerned. I'm talking about uh, a specific component of the Middle East. On February the 6th, led by Faisal, the Arabs presented their position. On February 27, the Jews presented their position. It's very important to know that before those pre these presentations, 
an agreement was entered into on January the 3rd, 1919, between Faisal and Wiseman. Don't have time to go in. I could spend an hour on this agreement. Look at what it says. There's supposed to be Arab states and Palestine. There's a recognition that Palestine is going to be distinct from the Arab state. And they clearly set out in this document the intent to honor the declaration on November 2, 1917, regarding uh, honoring the aspirations of the Jewish people. So on February the 6th, you have a presentation. Please note the five countries who are the Supreme Council, who have the power of disposition, who listen to the presentations. In his presentation, Faisal asked for recognition of the Arabs as a people in international law. And he wants independence in a huge component of territories that used to be controlled by the Turks. And, I stress, he says, as far as Palestine is concerned, he wants to leave it to the sign. Remember, he just entered into an agreement, an agreement with, with Wiseman, that that would be for the Jews. How much has been forgotten? How much has been disregarded over the years? And then February 27, the Jewish presentation. Again, the five nations. It's important because they, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. They're going to get title from the, the Turks and they're going to have the power of disposition over those territories. So it's really important what is presented to them. The Zionist organization presents its essential case. They want recognition of the historic title of the Jewish people to Palestine, not to any territory, to Palestine and the right of the Jews to reconstitute what they used to have. This is huge. Can you imagine if that was granted, if that was recognized? Then you have to look at what they used to have in Jerusalem, what they used to have in Hebron, what they used to have in every component of the territory, because they will have the right to reconstitute. They talk about the, the borders. They present a map. And what they want is not instant independence, but they want a, a trust system set up uh, with an international organization to give opportunity uh, for the necessary immigration to take place so that they have enough people to have a solid nation. So it, it's, it's like asking uh, for a womb in which the, the, the child will grow and, and, and be ready for, for birth. Here's the map. They ask for a territory which is more or less equivalent to what was biblically significant. I could spend time on this, but here's the map. Next, the covenant of the League of Nations. One of the pillars of the case for Israel, of the case for the Jewish people. In the midst of everything else that was going on, led by President Wilson, there was a desire to come up with a solution or a framework that would prevent the kind of war that almost destroyed the entire world, the First World War. So out of that came the covenant of the League of Nations. It was to promote international cooperation and, and the respect of international law. Adopted in, uh, in, uh, in April of 1919, in, injected into the Treaty of Versailles in June, became a, a treaty binding on the nations that signed it. Important for the Jewish people in Israel because in the covenant is Article 22. A brand new concept is introduced. The, contrast, the concept of mandates, international mandates. And it was designed to help those who would get independence, that would have nations, that would come out of all this with their state but designed to, to help them to develop. And I'm going to show you that as far as what was known as Mesopotamia is concerned, or Iraq, the beneficiaries were the Arab inhabitants. I'm going to show you that as far as Syria is in Lebanon were concerned, again, the inhabitants, the Arabs, but not for Palestine. Just an example of the power of these five nations. Article 119, Treaty of Versailles, when Germany renounced title in, many in respect to many territories. Who got title? 
It's right there, the five principal allied powers. Same thing in respect to Austro-Hungarian monarchy. The five powers get title. Look at the relevant article. This is important because it's gonna happen as far as Palestine is concerned, the San Remo Conference. We are in the 100th year, the anniversary year of that conference in April of 1920. I was supposed to have a, a big event in San Remo and regrettably because of the circumstances we're all dealing with, that was ca canceled and uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to go back there soon. The conference of April 1920, this is a very key defining moment in history. This is the Villa de Vachon in 1919, and you see it today. I've been there many times. And the key thing is that the Supreme Council did not make a decision in respect to what they heard on February the 6th and February 27 from the Arabs and, and the Zionist delegation. They, they were so busy that they left Paris. They were there for six months. And then they reconvene in this beautiful place on the Italian Riviera and, and deliberated for two days. They were there longer than two days. They were there for a week. They had other issues. But for two days, they focus on the decision relating to the claims of the Arabs and the Jews. Who was there? Took a while to figure out who was who. But these are the key participants, the leaders, Millerand, Prime Minister of France, Lloyd George, of course, we know who he is, Prime Minister of England, the Prime Minister of Italy was there. Uh, the Japanese are standing in the back. Uh, the Americans were represented, but Wilson wasn't there because of health issues. So here they are, they made a decision. They're standing in front of the villa. What was the decision? Remember we talked about the Balfour Declaration being an egg that had to be fertilized to create the rights in international law? Well, these powers have the, all of the necessary rights and authority to make the decision, and they take the Balfour Declaration and introduce it and incorporate it into international law. The policy of supporting the national aspirations of the Jewish people as defined by Herzl in, in the Basel conference and many other documents is adopted, endorsed by the five powers. Curzon, who was a key member of the British delegation as a secretary of state, makes it very clear that Palestine is to be in the future the national home, Palestine national home of the Jews throughout the world. This is a very singular, unique, distinct aspect of the decision. The, the beneficiaries of the other mandates are the inhabitants. The beneficiaries of this mandate, the mandate for Palestine, are the Jews throughout the world. Those who don't reside in Palestine are deemed to be residents virtual inhabitants, and their rights continue to this day, in my opinion. Now, the Prime Minister of England, who led the discussion, was asked, of course, what, what should the boundaries be? Well, he said, they should be from Dan to Beersheba. The French representative had some difficulty with that. What do you mean? What do you mean? So he ends up referring to a book by George Adam Smith. And in this book, there's a map, map 34. And Lord George takes the position, this should be, these should be the boundaries. Here's the cover page of the book. And here's the map, map 34. So if you're Jewish, you've seen lots of maps, lots of maps that go back to biblical times. I'm often asked when I make presentations, how could you make reference to a map that, uh, that refers to the, uh, David and, and Solomon? Well, I'm sorry. That's the very document relied upon by the powers in St. Remo in defining, in, in, in coming to a decision on the boundaries of the, the, the country, of the, of the territory to be given to the Jews. Every Jewish individuals should be familiar with this map. 
it was one of the foundations of the decisions. Well, by the way, in, in the same book, there's a this Jerusalem, a beautiful uh, map of Jerusalem. And you have to remember that that's the Jerusalem basically for almost 19 centuries. It didn't change until the end of the, the 19th century. And, and so when we talk about Jerusalem a little late, later, don't forget this. The intent of the nations is to, if you use the green line, the, the old city is not gonna be part of the state of, uh, of, of the Jerusalem of the, of the state of Israel. But if you do that- George, which do, book are you referring to? It's the book, this one. Okay. And um, in fact, I'll come back to that later during the question period. So do I think this was an important decision? It was the defining moment as far as the rights of the Jewish people are concerned and the rights of the Arabs. Because in the same meeting, during the same two days, the answer is given to the Arabs. Yes, we consider you a people in international law and, and huge territories are set aside for their, their to, to, to be in response to their aspirations and claims. Wiseman, here's what he had to say. Just jump to, to the last part. It's no exaggeration to say that this decision is most important moment in the whole history of our people since the exile. So if you think that I'm overstating, exaggerating the importance of this, of this decision, well, look at his words. Following the conference, there was a treaty. That was a whole idea. Come to decisions on what terms to impose on the Ottoman Empire. The treaty of said, August 10, 1920. Look at Article 132. Turkey renounces its title rights, its sovereignty rights in favor of the principal powers. So, you know the title has passed. And Article 95 includes the policy of the Balfour Declaration. It's now part of international law. Shortly after the British and the French agreed on boundaries, the next stop is of course the mandate for Palestine. I've got a, a copy of, of this document, which is without doubt the Charter of Rights of the Jewish people, the Mandate for Palestine. Comes right out of the San Remo Conference. And I know exactly where the original is in, in London. And the first draft, the first draft, because it, there was another draft after that, but look at the first sentence of the preamble. It captures the essence of the Treaty of Sev, whereby as a result of the treaty, Turkey has renounced its rights in respect to Palestine in favor of the principal allied powers. Here's a copy of the front page of the, the original. Article two of the Mandate for Palestine. This is where there's a commitment made in an international treaty, binding an international law, an international treaty which specifies that the policy of the Balfour Declaration is to be implemented and pursued as laid down in the preamble. What does it say in the preamble? Do you remember what the Zionist delegation asked for on February 27 in Paris? Recognition of their historical uh, connection and the right to reconstitute what they used to have. Well, it's there in the treaty. Decision made, rights granted. What on earth are we doing pretending that this has never happened? If you compare the, the key provisions of the three mandates, you will see how two are for the people who inhabit those lands. But in the mandate for Palestine, it's all about the recognition of the historical connection and the right to reconstitute it to establish a home for the Jewish people, a nation, a state. So here's the result. The uh, territory that comes out of the deliberations and the negotiations between the British and the French, the two key powers that dealt with these territories, you've got those in front of you. Article 25 of the mandate. This is a very key 
relevant provision as far as what's happening over the next weeks. Look at Article 25. It is a new article added or introduced by the British after the original draft. In my view, contrary to the spirit of the mandate for Palestine and the letter of the mandate for Palestine, giving them the right to partition Palestine and to give away two thirds of it, provided they respect articles 15, 16, and 18. You see that. Please note, whatever they did, those articles have to be honored and complied with in Transjordan. The original Article 25, you see it there, had nothing to do with partition. This is a change made by the British because of the pressures they were facing in those days. In September 1922, the British had already more or less, there was a de facto separation or partition, and they introduced this to the Council of the League, and they basically, in this, take the position that many provisions of the, the mandate will not be applicable in, in, in Transjordan. And uh, the uh, commitment is made by the British to make sure that certain provisions will continue to be honored in the area that's just been given to the Arabs, including Article 15. No discrimination of any kind. That was supposed to be respected over there. You know what happened. It wasn't honored. Article 16, no measures to be taken to, to, to interfere or discriminate against uh, anyone on the ground of religion and nationality. That was supposed to be honored over there. And can you imagine, if that was supposed to be honored in, in the area given to the, the Arabs in, in, in Transjordan, how much more the case in every part and component of what was left of Palestine. This is a map of the, um, made by the League of Nations showing you what happened. I like this. This is very important for those of you who are concerned about what's happening in the, politically right now. Within Palestine, an Arab government is established. The People seeking rights were Arabs and Jews. The Arabs ended up getting Transjordan. They were not supposed to. So in Palestine, there is an Arab state. The result was this. Treaty of Lausanne was the, the final treaty with the Turks, which completed what was left uh, dangling because the Treaty of Sev wasn't signed. But the Treaty of Sev, in my view, is absolutely relevant because it is a codification. It reflects what was decided in St. Remo. No time to talk about the McDonald White Paper. What a transgression, transgression by the British, where they basically nullify the, the key rights of the Jewish people under the mandate. Next stop, the UN Charter and Resolutions. The final resolution of the League of Nations, which was dissolved, makes it clear that the nations are supposed to continue to administer their territories for the well being and development of the people's concern. There was an ongoing obligation to keep honoring and, 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 and respecting the rights of the Jewish people in that area. Article 80 of the Charter of Nations is very key in, in this analysis because. It protects all the rights given before the treaty called the Charter, the UN Charter, was, was uh, signed. The prior rights are to be honored and respected. Everything I've just been presenting to you is supposed to be protected by this clause. Partition resolution, just remember that it was a General Assembly recommendation, not binding. I'm interested in sources, not what is not binding. The birth of the State of Israel, 1948. This is another relevant event historically because in that moment, as of May 15, 48, midnight, uh, the Jewish people assert their rights in respect to at least part of the territory that was granted, that was bequeathed to them. In the Declaration of 
of independence. I, I wish I had been a counsel to, to Ben Gurion at the time because I would have asked him to make a huge reference to the San Remo Conference, but he does refer to the Balfour Declaration and the Mandate for Palestine and the fact that the historical connection has been recognized and, and, and the rights that are set out in all the documents are, are, are referred to here. Now, after the War of Independence, a treaty is signed between the Israel and Jordan. This is so important. It is an armistice agreement that says that nothing in it is to prejudice the rights and claims of the positions of the parties as far as sovereignty, as far as, as, far as title is concerned. Nothing. It's just under the law of war. It, it enables the parties to, to stop fighting and, and, and to establish where their possession is going to be at the time, but nothing about, about entitlements. However, this green line that everybody keeps talking about over the last decades is precisely merely an armistice line. As a lawyer, as a human rights advocate, I'm astonished by the fact that this has been disregarded, what it really is. International Court of Justice has made it very clear in another case that the fact that the League is gone doesn't take away from the, the effects, the, the continuing entitlements of the Jews and, and, the, and Israel under the mandate for Palestine. 1967, the war resulting in this possession of territories. And uh, you will note that uh, the Sinai was part of it. It was given back. Um, the resolution, which is relevant, relevant. I must say 242 is not a binding resolution. It's under uh, chapter six of the UN Charter. And as Israel's uh, as one concerned about the entitlements of Israel, I would say to the government of Israel, it is noteworthy that this is a conditional, conditional commitment. We'll withdraw if, if certain conditions are met, and we'll withdraw from territories, not all territories. And if you go back to those who drafted the resolution, it was clearly understood that Israel had no intention of withdrawing from all territories. It came out of the Sinai, and, and that's done. It's come out of Gaza to a large extent. Uh, there's still an issue, an issue there, and it's come out of, of part of the disputed territories. Even though there's still a presence, certainly Area A is, is under basic Palestinian control. Annexation, 1980, capital of uh, Israel, Jerusalem. There's a, a, a step taken to assert, to completely assert, the sovereignty of Israel over Jerusalem. The result, if we divided Jerusalem today, based on the green line would be this, old city would be part of the Palestinian capital. There's a Security Council resolution, which I won't talk about right now because I've run out of time, but the, the point is this, the rights have been given, the rights have been denied. It is crucial, crucial for people of good faith, and I speak all over the world, and I, I am surprised at the extent to which people of, with, with a conscience that's still alive will say to me, we didn't understand, we didn't know the facts. Well, here are the facts. Charles, up to you. Thank you very much, Jacques, uh, for the comprehensive presentation. Um, it's impressive. So I'm, I'm gonna, as you were speaking in, in great historical depth, and knowledge. I was thinking that to, to, of today, today the foreign minister of Germany is in uh, visiting Jerusalem with advice for the Israeli government on uh, issues of annexation. And for me, when I was looking at these documents and how uh, Germany uh, gave up its uh, claims to the area in, I think, 1919, you mentioned, um, sorry, in April of 2020, uh, 1920, uh, I'm sorry. Of 1919, they gave up their claims to the region. Um, and after the Holocaust and after giving up claims, and what authority is Germany coming to tell the Jewish people in Israel where to draw its borders? Any thoughts and comments on, on your historical understanding, bringing it to today's news? Okay. Well, Charles, you have to understand that my objective 
is, is to impart information about the historical facts that support the legal position of Israel. I, I'm not here to say that to come to an answer in respect to the big legal questions means you have the answers politically. Yeah, you know, there, there are many political scientists, there are many politicians, and, and so I have to be careful. But I, I have to say, I would say, if he was sitting in, in my living room today, I would say, sir, the narrative you've relied upon is a false narrative. Allow me to present to you the historical facts that support the conclusion that the Jews and Israel are in the land everywhere as of right. Allow me to do that. And I believe deep down that the pathway to peace is through the recognition that the Jewish people in Israel have these rights and that they're not in fact usurpers and, and uh, I'm, I'm concerned at the movements internationally right now that will go as far as saying that Israel has no entitlement to the territory that is now part of Israel, never mind the disputed territories, never mind Jerusalem. So it, it's, it's crucial if, if one is truly pursuing an answer to this ongoing problem for decades and decades and decades to go back and realize that when Israel wants to be recognized as a Jewish state, this is precisely what the nation supported and recognized. And now they're making a big fuss about a Jewish state. Whereas all the, the neighboring states are Islamic Republic of this and everything else is, it's okay if, you're, if it's Islam, but the Jewish people have been given that right. So I would say to, uh, to this man, if, 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 if you're truly interested, note the importance of the, the true historical account. And uh, conclusion from at least this lawyer is that the people who are in, in Gush Etzion, who are in Evron today, the, the Jewish people have the right to be there. And because you recognize the historical connection, you can't allow a Palestinian state to be established in which all the Jews will be expected to get out. Do you remember the article set out in Article 25 of, of the mandate? They have the right to have their communities there. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of people writing in. They would like to know where your slides and where this information is available. Is it available to people who would like to access it and review it? Well, if um, if they write you, Charles, and and um, and have specific requests, I will do everything I can to provide the answers through your organization, through ESGAP. Okay. Wonderful. And also, this uh, session is being recorded, so you can go back to uh, look at the slides more carefully. There's some amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of information, amazing information. So thank you, um, David Goldberg. Would like to ask you. How is it possible for Israel to annex the West Bank if this territory has never been under Jordanian sovereignty? Um, I have spent the last uh, half hour explaining the entitlement of the Jewish people to those territories. I must say that uh, there was a mistake from my perspective not to annex all of the territories after 1967 instead of merely annexing Jerusalem, should the state of Israel have annexed the territories, they had the right to do so. The extent to which the disputed territories are occupied today, and I have no problem because that occupation is a principle of international law. The problem I have is the designation of these territories as occupied Palestinian territories. Since when does the law of war relating to occupation result in the granting of sovereignty entitlements? This is concocted in this case only because of the extent to which the nations are willing to buy anything, to accept anything which is anti-Israel. It is occupied, but in my opinion, it is occupied Jewish 
territory, only occupied because it wasn't annexed as a result of a decision of the government of Israel in order to try to reach a practical, realistic arrangement and peace arrangement with the Palestinians. But today, if you want to deal with the question marks, all they have to do is annex. They have the right to do so. Okay, thank you. David Gurevich, a, a scholar in Israel, colleague, asks, uh, first of all, he thanks you for your uh, in, in, important talk. A quick question on, the interna on international law. You mentioned that the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181 was not binding. However, the UN Security Council Resolution 478, which abolishes the annexation of the pre-1967 part of Jerusalem to Israel, was binding. And my question is, therefore, would you say that the UN Security Council Res Res Resolution 478 is less binding than the San Remo document? And if yes, why? Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something which... Uh, relates to this, and uh, it has to do, well, I, I won't take the time to read it. it to, uh, Balfour, when he, he spoke at the opening sessions of the League of Nations in 1920, stressed to the council the following. Please note that this League of Nations has no right to take away from the entitlements of the beneficiaries of the various trusts, including the mandate for Palestine. The creators of those rights were the, was the Supreme Council. The Supreme Council created the League of Nations. And the, the, the League was merely a trustee. And even though they have a role in, 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 the, in the process of, 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 of dealing with the final determination, they don't have the right to take away the rights. So Article 80 confirms what I've just told you. And any Security Council resolution that goes against the spirit and the letter of Article 80, everything that happened before, that basically recreates rights and obligations for, for, for the, the parties over there, is a violation of international law. Thank you, Jacques. So, uh, Andrea Spindel of Toronto, here, you know, I think you know each other. Uh, given this information, given the information that pr was presented by Jacques Oche for many years, why then do Western powers seem to ignore it? Why do all but the United States acknowledge the sovereignty, sovereignty is a legal right? Why so many threats of sanctions from the UK, Canada, France, and other countries? Why do they get by choosing not to support Israel? Uh, good question. Um, Part of the answer I've, I've already mentioned is the complexity of, of, of the answer. If, if, I, I, I try to summarize the sources in, in, in half an hour, but I really need one hour for each of the sources. So it's easy to get tangled up and, and, and not to get to the right answer. So uh, I, I think the majority of people who have been in, in the audiences uh, uh, have spoken in, in over the years, they just don't know all of the information. So it's easy to present a false narrative when the atmosphere is so hostile, when there's so much anti-Semitism around the world. The, the nations and, and the UN, everybody's so ready to accept the false narrative. So part of the answer is the complexity of, of the information I've, I've presented. Uh, the other part is, of course, um, the, uh, the agenda of uh, the Arab nations, of the Islamic nations, who, uh, French, frankly, uh, if, if you don't understand replacement theology, then you're missing something important. According to their theology, you know, that land is to go to the believers in Islam. And, and uh, the fact that Israel has pro prospered there is a huge problem, because if they have been cursed, if they have been rejected by God, according to their theology, what on earth is happening in that land? They're prospering. They're strong from many perspectives. So um, the, the, their motivation is to convince as many nations as possible to, to agree with them. And, um, and they've been very successful. So Jacques, this brings me to, I'm going to ask you a, a question. So my work is more focusing more on contemporary anti-Semitism. 
And to make a long story short, there's different types of anti-Semitisms with an S. There's the sort of the Christian religious form of anti-Semitism. There was the racist form of anti-Semitism. And I would argue the most uh, potent form of contemporary anti-Semitism is the demonization of Israel and Jewish peoplehood, as you've pointed out, is the theme running through your, your presentation and your work. Um, you speak of the Arab claims that delegitimize Israel, but I would also argue that in the Western Academy, in the finest universities in Europe and North America, the demonization or the delegitimization of who Jews are as a people seems to me to be gathering speed at the intellectual level. And in the sort of age of postmodernity, now in the United States with the sort of the struggle against racism, which certainly I believe has real merit, the kind of the categorization of Jews as white, as European, as apartheid, as racist, as so the delegitimization, the, the demonization of who Jews are as a people seems to be gathering pace in Western Ac ac uh, academic settings. Do you can you comment on the 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 relevance of that to delegitimizing the claims of the Jewish people in Israel that you've outlined so eloquently? Well, again, Charles, uh, I'm a jurist. I'm concerned about human rights, and I I, I don't want to pretend to be a, a political expert here. But the reason the false narrative concerning entitlements to sovereignty is so accepted, is so wide, widespread, is because of the, the high degree of hostility I've referred to in university campuses. And there, there is a, a concern that I have, which I have to make reference to right now. It's, and it's the division among the Jewish people around the world, the division of the Jewish people in Israel. It doesn't help when the world is so unified in trying to take away the rights that have been given to Israel and the Jewish people, it doesn't help when the Jewish people are divided. And my plea, my request would be, whatever your political solution might be, at least agree that the rights were given as I have set out in this lecture today. I take the position that the components that are presented are irrefutable. I'm not trying to defend them. It's the truth and each and every one of them I can prove. So if that is the case, why don't we start among the Jewish people with an agreement that, oh yeah, we're there as of right. Now let's deal with the, 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 the next part. Well, how, do we, how do we resolve the, the conflict? But uh, the fact that so many Jews, you know, I was invited to speak at a conference a number of years ago in, in Southampton organized by, by scholars and there were 50 speakers and there were two speakers who supported Israel. I was one of them. I was told, don't go. No, no, I, I accepted. It was eventually canceled, the Southampton conference. But the, the, the sad thing is that most of the organizers were Jewish. And uh, so that conflict, that, that is a source of great, concern for me. And it helps, it helps what's happening on the campuses, Charles, which is so negative for the Jewish people mm. in Israel. Well, sitting in Oxford, if you were at a conference with two supporters of Israel, I'd say that's pretty good, but I regress. <laughs> um, so apropos, there's a question from Carl Steig, and he asks, even, even with the history so well presented, given the state of the current, current global affairs and politics, how practical would it be for Israel to actually annex the territories that are majority Arab or Palestinian populated? Okay, it's a, it's a very good question, but you're taking me away from, yes. Yes. from, from my, my mandate. Okay. I, for years and years and years, I'm, I've been speaking around the world in an attempt to counter the false narratives about the legal entitlements. I, I, I don't want to get into specifics of, of political uh, approaches right now because I, I, I'm not, an, there are many others who are experts. All I want to say is that should there be annexation in the coming days, it would be merely the assertion of the rights, the redeeming, redeeming of redeemable rights that have been given to the Jewish people in Israel. 
That's very important. Um, Carol Klingfield from New Haven, Connecticut asked a question, an old friend, hello, Carol. She asks, uh, words are so critical, as the professor states. Would, you, would he argue that the term annexation is also feeding a false narrative? Should we therefore always refer to Israel's sovereignty over territory and not an annexation? So um, that's political as well, <laughs> or is that you know, legal, from a legal perspective? You, you live on this planet, and there are international laws governing the nations on this planet. And uh, the, the principle of occupation is well recognized uh, in, in international law. And, you know, call it what you want. If, if you assert sovereignty over a Area C or part of Area C in the coming weeks, it will be considered annexation. And I'm, I'm not going to be standing anywhere saying, no, 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 it wasn't annexation. But it, it, what, what it is meant by that is what you possess is then uh, further uh, treated with a covering of sovereignty. And there's a degree of possession, for instance, in Area C, uh, and, and that would uh, now be an area subject to Israeli law. It, it would be quite different. Uh, it would be uh, today, there's military rules applicable to these uh, communities, and all of a sudden it would be Israeli law. So uh, I don't think anybody internationally would not consider this annexation. Okay, we usually stop at uh, on top of the hour sh sharp, but because we, there's so many questions, we'll continue for 10 more minutes, if that's okay, Jacques. No, it's okay with me. Okay, good. I have Thanks. a lot more to say. We have many questions. So, uh, and very quickly, are the territories uh, occupied or are they disputed from a, from a legal perspective? You know, I, I like the expression disputed, uh, but I don't think the government of Israel would take the position today that it's not occupied. These are not occupied territories because if, if it wasn't occupied, it would have been, these territories would have been subject to Israeli law since 1967 or shortly thereafter. So I, occupation is merely, please, you know, let's get over it. Occupation is merely the description of an area where there's been no final determination as to who is the sovereign. So if you agree with that definition, all of us today should be in agreement that yeah, there, there, there's no final determination yet because Israel has failed to annex. It's been a bone of contention and don't forget resolution 242. And, and this is a, a very crucial resolution because it, it was Security Council under Chapter 6, therefore not really binding, but Israel agreed to it. In it, it says it would withdraw from territories. And Lord Carrington, who drafted the resolution, has spoken over and over about the fact that it was never the intent of Israel or the expectation of the na nations that Israel would withdraw from all the, the territories it occupied. Well, gave up Sinai mm -hmm. and no longer in control of Gaza. But right now, I would say to the leaders of the nations, what on earth are you fussing about? It was always understood that Israel would not withdraw from all the territories. It was always understood that the principle of historical connection would still be relevant. So, you know, my, my problem doing the work on, on the status of Jerusalem, I focused on Jerusalem and the answers I got for Jerusalem are applicable to other parts of the territories. But to summarize the connection between the Jewish people and Jerusalem, it's like la mer à boire trying to drink the sea. It's, the connections are so numerous. It, I, I ended up with 200 pages. It could have been 2,000 pages. So yes, totally, totally part of what has been recognized, historically connected, and can be reconstituted by the Jewish people. So, and Jacques, so we have a question from Edith Sammers, and she asks, um, how does your analysis, legal, historical analysis, uh, compare with Israeli Supreme Court decisions related to sovereignty? Are you, are they, 
Are there, is, are there deviations? Has the Israeli Supreme Court taken different positions? Or Yes, the Supreme Court of Israel has taken positions that, that are, in my view, disregard the rights that have already been granted to the Jewish people in Israel in respect to the territories. Full stop. What, and what would be the legal reasoning for that, do you think? It's just, it's... Well, uh, again, you're taking me away okay. from a pure analysis of, but uh, I'll dare to venture in to, uh, with an answer. The international court, the international court in The Hague is not a real legal court. It's a political entity. The decisions made in 2004, for instance, in the Fence case, against Israel, the advisory opinion, which is not binding, but disregarded almost everything which I have presented to, to you uh, as been part of my presentation today on the sources of the rights. It's a political entity, not a true judicial body. I'm afraid when I read some of the decisions of the Supreme Court of Israel that I have to come to the same conclusion. The, many of the judges are driven by a political agenda and in the process, they forget key legal rights and entitlements. So given the ignorance, I have to say, I use that word uh, sadly, but given the ignorance in the Jewish community in, in around the world in the diaspora and also in Israel, what would you recommend in terms of education of getting uh, Jewish people as well as other non-Jewish people to understand this powerful and deep claim that the Jewish nation has to its land? Okay, uh, two aspects to my answer. The, the first has to do with the government of Israel. A number of years ago when I met leaders in different uh, government departments and different ministers, the answer I got was a lot of praise for my work, followed by the comment that, well, we're too late. The Palestinian narrative in terms of international law is carved in stone, we're wasting time. My answer to that is that if, you're if, it, if it's the truth, don't be silent. Light overcomes darkness. You must never be silent if you know it's the truth. More recently, over the last couple of years, a huge change. Two conferences have been organized by several departments, ministries of the government of Israel, with me as the keynote speaker to present what I presented to you today. You imagine the embarrassment when I'm in the European Parliament or in London in the House of Lords and people say to me, that was very, very convincing, but how come the government of Israel doesn't present these same arguments? Well, that's changing, I'm encouraged. And uh, so that, that's an important part of the answer. Good, uh, good. So on that positive yeah. note, Go ahead. <laughs> that positive note, so we'll end it here and um, Jacques, thank you very much for joining us, taking your time and joining us today for the webinar. And also, thank you very much for your decades of uh, hard work and research uh, compiling this incredible and important and inform vital information. So thank you very much. It, it was my privilege to be part of this. Thank you, Jacques. forward to being in touch soon. I'll see you in Toronto when we can fly. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, be well. Thank you, Jacques.